Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Enviro School today. All information contained herein is provided solely for educational purposes. It is not intended as a substitute for professional or legal advice. Should you decide to act upon any information contained in this presentation, you do so at your own risk. This is the Enviro School program at the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. Today we are presenting overview of the Superfund program and Superfund sites. I'm Tamika Prilo, co coordinator for Enviro School, and I will be moderating today. Everyone's line is muted except for the speaker. However, just as a precaution, go ahead and keep yourself muted individually as well. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A option. Type them in and we will answer them at the end of the presentation live. Slides and a recording of this webinar will, will be available on the Enviro School website. There will be a poll at the end of this webinar to provide your feedback so we can improve our sessions. So please complete before logging off. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please email me at enviroschool at la.gov. Also, there's a Note in the chat that if you would like a certificate of participation afterwards, please email me at Enviro School as well. Our speaker today is Keith Horn. Keith has a bachelor's and master's degree in conservation and biology from Southeastern Oklahoma State University and the University of Louisiana Monroe. Keith is currently serving as a senior environmental scientist in the remediation division here at LDEQ. Following a period of working for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Service, he began his career here in 1992. <clears throat> Keith has 28 years of experience in site investigation and assessment, remediation, remediation and related areas. Keith, please begin. Thank you, Tamika. Um, well, as Tamika said, I'm Keith Horn, and uh, I've been around for a long time, uh, as you can see. Um, I like to joke that Edwin Edwards and I started the same day, and that's just, that is true, but uh, it is a coincidence, nothing to do with uh, Mr. Edwards. But uh, anyway, um, I am, uh, one of my roles at DEQ is to be coordinator for our Superfund program in Louisiana. And uh, for those of you that are unaware of the Superfund program, it is uh, properly known as CERCLA, and we'll talk about what that means. It's a federal program. And uh, here in Louisiana, the remediation division of DEQ uh, interfaces with the US EPA to, um, you know, administer the circular program and to uh, deal with it. So, all right, next slide. All right, so I guess we need to first talk about what is Superfund or CERCLA. And uh, as we said, it is, uh, was established uh, by the federal law, which is known as the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, and this was uh, passed in 1980. So CERCLA is the acronym for that. Now, important terms to get out of this uh, legislation, uh, it's supposed to be comprehensive environmental response, and that's good. It, it is a very comprehensive environmental program, but two of the key things that make CERCLA or Superfund work are the uh, last parts, which is the compensation and liability. Uh, the C and L in CERCLA are very important and have driven a great deal of environmental um, action in Louisiana and throughout the country, really. Um, so let's look at this a little more. We'll move on to the next point. It is a, oh, no, sorry, Tamika, go back. Okay, the next bullet point. It is uh, a federal program which is designed to fund the cleanup of sites contaminated with hazardous substances and pollutants and it has never been authorized to the state. Now, that um, term, uh, hazardous substance is important and uh, pollutants is included in CERCLA. And it's, as I mentioned, a federal program. You know, RICRA is authorized by the state, the DEQ uh, administers RICRA because we have a authorized program. There is no such thing for CERCLA, only EPA uh, administers CERCLA. Now, we are certainly partners with EPA uh, but it's uh, their program. They make the final decisions and uh, they do so in consultation with us, but we, we don't run this show. So, 
All right, so what was Circle of Four? Well, it was designed to address those sites that were left out by the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. That's RICRA. You may um, know it as the Hazardous Waste Law and Hazardous Waste Regulations. Um, some of the sites that Circle was intended to address predated RICRA. So they were already there before RICRA defined hazardous waste and how you could dispose of it. Some of the most famous ones, of course, are Love Canal and then the Valley of the Drums. Then others uh, were not properly closed out under RICRA. We have a number of sites in Louisiana where in theory, RICRA was the law of the land, but in practice, these sites did not achieve a proper RICRA closure, and uh, they ended up uh, becoming circular or Superfund sites. Uh, what Superfund does, at least as far as the law, you know, RICRA defines hazardous waste. It tells you what is hazardous waste and where you can dispose of it and where you can't dispose of it. Circular defines hazardous substances, and that's an important de uh, definition. Now, hazardous substances under CERCLA excludes petroleum products. So um, hydrocarbons are not hazardous substances in the eyes of EPA and of CERCLA. Now, in the state regulation, that's not exactly true because our definition is different. But under CERCLA, CERCLA does not see or clean up hydrocarbons. They just not part of the law. Uh, they were excluded from the law specifically. Now, the other thing that CERCLA or Superfund did is it uses risk-based cleanup levels. Now, this is another critically important point about CERCLA because we all have our risk-based corrective action programs or here in uh, Louisiana, we have the RECAP, which is the um, you know, risk evaluation corrective action program. Texas has its program. Arkansas has a program. Everybody has a program. Well, all these probabilistic risk assessment programs came from CERCLA because the question was, you know, Superfund program had all these sites that were contaminated with hazardous substances. And the question was, uh, when cleaning them up, how clean is clean? That was the question. That's a big concept. So probabilistic risk assessment that we all use today came from the Superfund program. It came from CERCLA. It originally started in what was called RAGS, which is Risk Assessment Guidance for Superfund. And then RAGS um, evolved. And then from RAGS and the various calculations in RAGS, we all developed our various state programs. So risk-based cleanups came from Superfund. OK, to me. All right. So let's talk about Superfund a little more and how it works. Um, under Superfund, the EPA, you know, that compensation and liability part, this is where it's very important. The EPA may identify potentially responsible parties. These are PRPs. Um, they are responsible for hazardous substances released to the environment, and they may compel them to clean up sites or it may undertake the cleanup on its own using the super fund, which is a trust fund. That's where the term super fund came from and cost recovered from the PRPs. Uh, another scary thing about that liability and uh, early on in the program is if the PRPs refused to clean up a site and then EPA used the trust fund or you know federal monies to clean up the site, they could then sue the PRPs in federal court and recover what's called triple damages. That is, from each PRP, they were recovered three times what the PRP should have paid to clean up the site in the eyes of the court. So that was a powerful um, motivational uh, tool. They could always threaten to, hey, you know, PRPs, if you don't play ball, we're going to go in and take care of the problem, and then we're going to go and get your money. So that compensation liability part, I told you, is very important. Okay, so the second point on this page is throughout the 1980s, most of the funding from Superfund came from a tax on commercial petroleum and chemical products. However, this tax was not renewed in 1990. So um, the tax was originally passed with the Superfund regulation in the 1980s, uh, 1980 when it, the law became you know, the law of the land, and then it had renewals built into it. And uh, there, in 1990, the tax was not renewed. So the idea of the Superfund tax was that the polluters paid. Well, that uh, was, I guess, true, you know, although it was a tax on all 
petrochemical industries, you know, not just the ones that were responsible for certain sites, although many of them were responsible for some of the sites. So, um, but after 1990, there, the tax was not renewed. So um, the Superfund went on budget. So we went from the polluters paying to the taxpayers paying. So it comes from the general fund. Although, uh, keep in mind the PRPs, the liability provisions still exist. So wherever possible, you know, uh, EPA tries to identify those PRPs and make the polluters clean up the site. But we have any number of sites under the program where there are no uh, viable, potentially responsible parties. Everyone has either went bankrupt long ago or whatever. So the federal government and the state government have to, uh, you know, cover the uh, cost of the remediation of the orphan sites, if you will. So, and another little thing that CERCLA did, it was written, written into the CERCLA regulation, was to create the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, or the ATSDR, who are also involved in environmental uh, risk assessment and um, their, um, you know, that probabilistic risk assessment stuff we talked about. So that's an important uh, creation. All right. So the next uh, thing we're talking about under Superfund is what sites qualify for Superfund? Does the gas station on the corner qualify? Well, no, because one, the gas station on the corner would uh, be exempt because of petroleum exemption. And secondly, it wouldn't score high enough. So what Superfund was designed to address was the sites that were the worst of the worst. That's another term you'll hear a lot whenever you talk about Superfund. It was designed to handle the sites that are called a national priority. And that's where we get the term NPL or national priorities list. So EPA is required by the law to use the hazard ranking system or HRS which is to count, we have lots of acronyms in the environmental field, don't we? But anyway, uh, the HRS is used to calculate a site score ranging from zero to 100 based on the actual or potential release of hazardous substances from a site. So they have various pathways. We just recently added a pathway, which is the, um, the vapor intrusion pathway. But uh, you, know, you have groundwater pathway, you have surface water pathway, you have Expo uh, surface or exposure pathway, the new subsurface uh, vapor intrusion pathway, and each pathway gets a score and then they're summed and you get a score. Now to be on the national priorities list and be eligible for a Superfund cleanup, the score has to be 28.5 or above. So, um, and where did that number come from? That's an interesting story. Well, EPA in developing the HRS had a list of sites that they felt like should be Superfund, that these sites, you know, should be Superfund. And so when the HRS was developed, they, they looked at this, they said, well, what number would cause these sites that we feel like should be Superfund to all be Superfund? And then that was 28.5. So there we have it. That's what it was. So it's kind of arbitrary, but it was based on the actual site inventory at the time HRS was developed. So once you score 28.5, um, like my friend Bart at uh, EPA says, hallelujah, we now have a Superfund site. Now we can clean it up. You know, we have the money, the federal government has the uh, ability to use the Superfund program to, to address the site on long-term remedial action, so clean up. So those are the NPL sites, or we sometimes call them remedial sites because they're um, eligible for long-term remedial action. Now, let's talk about the other possibility though, a site that scores less than 28.5. Um, so if it scores 28.0, that's not good enough. It does not go on the NPL, that cannot be proposed. It is returned to the state for further action under state laws. So a lack of action by the Superfund program following a site assessment does not mean that a site is not contaminated. It can be heavily contaminated. It uh, does not mean that site does not require cleanup. It very well could. It just means that that site is not a national priority for cleanup. So it does not get that long-term cleanup. It is not one of the worst of the worst, as we said. So. It's, uh, you know, a lot of people misunderstand that concept because Superfund assesses the site and finds that it is not a national party does not mean that there's not a problem there. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about other actions under Superfund, though. We've talked about the remedial program or the MPL, but uh, there is another branch to the Superfund um, program that we need to address, and this is the removal actions or the emergency response actions. Uh, EPA is authorized under the CERCLA program to perform these removal actions. Um, what they essentially are, simplest thing I can say, is that they're a source removal or a short term action. They do not require NPL listing. So sometimes these could occur before the Superfund assessment. Uh, it's better if it occurs during the Superfund assessment because you can count the removed stuff toward the site score. But uh, they, you do not have to have uh, a 28.5 score to do a removal action. Now, what does a removal action um, require? Well, now this is a great term. Uh, it requires that the site exhibit conditions that pose an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health and the environment. And then if you have an imminent and substantial endangerment condition, then a action memo has to be um, prepared and signed by EPA regional administrator or their designee. And then once that occurs, you can move forward with the removal action. So this is a funny thing. I remember uh, me and my boss back in the 90s, we, we were talking to an EPA on-scene coordinator and we said, you know, can you tell us what this imminent and, and substantial endangerment means? Can you give us uh, examples of conditions? And then we will, you know, we will not try to refer to you anything that, you know, wouldn't be appropriate. You know, what is the definition of this? And he kind of laughed as he goes, well, there is no definition. It isn't that an undefined regulatory term? Um, so it is whatever a EPA regional administrator will sign off on an action memo. Um, so, you know, one person's imminent substantial endangerment may not be to another, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's like that old saying, I know it when I see it, huh? So the EPA, when they see an imminent substantial endangerment and they convince the regional administrator that one exists, then you can do a removal action. So now what are these removal actions like? Well, they're limited typically to $2 million in cost and two years in duration. You know, it's not a long-term cleanup, it's a source removal action. So that's the usual rule of thumb, $2 million and two years in duration. Now, exceptions to this can be made. Um, you can have larger uh, costs and you have longer duration, you get an exception in these cases. Um, so some of the examples of ones that we've had in Louisiana, uh, we've had removal actions like West Bank asbestos, where the asbestos came in Cheraton Johns, Manville, all scattered all over the West Bank. That was an exceptional one. It went over two years and $2 million. And another one was New Orleans methylparathion, which was, uh, where parathon, methyl parathon was illegally uh, distributed in New Orleans area and used by people as roach spray and EPA had to do a lot of removal actions because that stuff is not, uh, you know, of course, appropriate for use in that manner. So there was a black market in it as it turns out. Now, um, so what are re removal actions typically supposed to do? They're address the source materials um, so you've got some waste in tanks, they're deteriorating, you take away the tanks and the waste. Uh, grossly contaminated media, so you've got, you know, soil that's saturated with this contaminants, you remove the contaminated soil. And, or unacceptable exposure uh, situations. Now, in this case, um, here's one example of an unaccept unacceptable exposure situation. You have some people drinking from a well that has hazardous substances in the groundwater. So that is unacceptable. So what they do is they connect them to the rural water district, you know, so that takes away the exposure situation. Doesn't clean up the groundwater, but solves the exposure. Um, so now another thing about removal actions is they can be enforcement actions. If there are PRPs identified, EPA can order them to do the removal action uh, to address the imminent substantial endangerment. Now, in other cases where either PRPs are unable or unwilling to do the action, then EPA can lead on these actions. So, Tamika? All right, so let's talk about a recent removal action here in Louisiana. Um, this one's over in the um, community of Evangeline, which is near Jennings, and this is at the Everwood um, Wood Treatment uh, Superfund site.
This building you see on your screen was the plant office for the Everwood Treating Company. And uh, later it uh, was converted by the landowner into, uh, as far as I know, it's always been a house since Everwood closed, but uh, people began living in this former office building uh, you know, before I got involved in the site, and that was in the 90s. So I don't know why, but this seems to be a strange thing in Louisiana. At wood preserving sites, which are generally almost always heavily contaminated, people always want to live in the office building that the, uh, the wood treating site had. This is the case for this one. Also, Union Creosote, which is a small creosote up in Union Parish. The other unfortunate thing, it seems that there often is either children or pregnant women living in these uh, structures um, when we come across it. So that was the case here. There were two uh, young children and a lady that lived here um, with uh, the son of the landowner. And uh, so, you know, when EPA began to do the assessment of the Everwood a treating company site, they took some samples in the yard of this house to see if there was a potential exposure for these, these on-site residents. And indeed there was, there was arsenic and dioxin uh, from the treating compounds that were used at Everwood. Everwood used, we call it the triple threat. They used both creosote, pentachlorophenol, which breaks down into dioxin, and uh, copper chromium arsenate or womanize, which is called CCA. And so they have um, all kinds of exposure issues. So what was done as a removal action uh, to address this exposure scenario was to remove one to two foot, depending on the depth of contamination, from the yard of this uh, former office, which is, as you see in this picture now, a home. Um, so on the left side, you see it during the removal action. This is on the, um, the uh, left side of the house. They only had to remove one foot on the other side. They got deeper into two foot. It was based on you know, sample results. And then the soil in the back is staged under those tarps. And then on the right is after the removal action, they removed one to two foot of soil, they backfilled it with clean soil, and they planted nice grass. It's really a nice uh, yard now. Um, but anyway, after that, uh, the lady that lived there convinced her husband, the son of the landowner, that, uh, you know, it might not be best if we have our kids living on a super fun site. And so, you know, hey, I applaud that decision. And so after they moved out for the removal, they never moved back in. However, the landowner's other son, I understand, lives there now. But at least he doesn't have a wife and children there. So, you know, a little bit, a little bit less exposure, I guess. All right, Tamika. All right, now, also at Everwood. Now, that first removal I told you about at the house, that was one removal action. It was limited to two years and $2 million. Now, another removal action was performed at Everwood. This was called the Everwood Tanks Removal Action. This was to address, uh, and this is more classic removal action, uh, you know, that yard removal action we talked about, that addressed an unacceptable exposure situation, right? Now, the Everwood Tanks is more of a classic removal action. It was intended to deal with the last remaining waste on the facility, the source material. So on the left, you see the pentachlorophenol tank that was uh, left at the facility, and it's covered in some, um, you know, sheeting and, and some uh, tape because they've removed all the trees from around it that had grown up around it. And you see that those trees are now mulched on the left there. And uh, they're preparing to actually remove the tank and its contents. So this was when it was being, um, you know, addressed. Now on the right hand side of the phase, we have a um, in ground, um, I, they call it a separator. It's a concrete structure that would catch the uh, pentachlorophenol solution that would uh, come out the treatment cylinders when they were opened and then the pentachlorophenol would be recovered and any water would be um, treat, uh, treated. I'm doing air quotes, you can't see that, but anyway, would be treated and then discharged under um, whatever rules existed back in the 70s and 80s. So um, that is uh, actually that brown stuff in there is a pentachlorophenol water mixture that's um, you know, very high and and contamination levels. So that was removed. And there was also an underground storage tank that contained pentachlorophenol from the old water separator, and that was removed. So this was more of a classic source removal action. Again, this is a separate action. We got a separate budget of $2 million and uh, two years duration. So sometimes you got to know how to play the game. So that's the removal uh, program. Uh, we do short term actions to remove source material and grossly contaminated media and to address unacceptable exposures. 
But let's look at the Superfund remedial process, the NPL listing, the long-term uh, remediation process. Now this, uh, I, I want to apologize for this diagram. This is EPA's diagram, not mine. Uh, but you know, hey, it, it's what it is. But uh, if we look at it on the left, we see a little diagram and it starts out with what it says, PASI, and you see everything's brown and, and scary. And then we follow the pathway of blue dots all the way up till everything's green and happy and we finish and we reuse the site. So, uh, hey, it's, it's okay, I guess. But uh, we start the Superfund remedial process at the site assessment phase. You know, either the state um, or EPA identifies a site that might have NPL potential. And uh, so a site discovery is done. And then to determine if it's gonna score 28.5, we have to do a site assessment. The site assessment done by P EPA under the Superfund program is a two-step um, process. The first is called the PA, our preliminary assessment. And the, that is generally a study of the site that uh, does not involve sampling. Uh, you look at the history of the site, the records, you look at the potentials, pathways, and so forth. And if all that indicates that, yes, it could be an NPL candidate, then you go on to the SI, which is the site inspections phase. And that's where EPA or their contractors or sometimes the states take samples uh, to determine if those NPL pathways are contaminated, determine if the targets are affected. And what you're looking for under the site assessment is a what we call an observed release. Uh, that is to determine if hazardous substances have been released to the environment. And uh, an observed release is different than a cleanup level. An observed release is either three times background or three times the sample quantitation limit if there is no background. So, um, so if you have a release in the site, uh, it could be a release that doesn't require cleanup, but it does show that the site is, is you know, releasing contaminants to the environment. So we do the PA and we do the SI, and um, if you know, the pathways give us a score that could be over 28.5, then EPA goes into the NPL listing process. And uh, they have to uh, publish it in the Federal Register as a proposed site. And then um, if there's you know, opportunity for comment and other stuff, and if that uh, goes forward, then we have it uh, in the Federal Register again as a final listing. And it's on the national priority list. Hallelujah, as Bart says, we have a super fun site. Now we can clean it up. So the next phase, once it's on the NPL, is we begin a remedial investigation. You say, wait, we already did an assessment. Why do we have to do a remedial investigation? Well, it serves a different purpose. The remedial investigation is designed to determine the extent of contamination. We're going to look at the horizontal and the vertical extent. We're going to look at those pathways in more detail. We're going to try to determine exactly how much cleanup we have to do. And then that's the remedial investigation. The feasibility study portion of this RIFS is to determine what are our options for cleaning up? What potential uh, options could we utilize? Could we dig it all up? Could we bioremediate it? Could we um, use capping and fencing? Could we do a combination of these things? You know, um, So you know, these are all looked at and they're, the various feasibilities of these options are investigated and cost um, estimates are developed so we can see um, what uh, you know, the various different options would cost. Okay, after the feasibility study has been completed, the EPA and the DQ and uh, other partners like Department of Health and uh, you know, EPA's ATSDR partners look at the results and a proposed plan is developed. And the proposed plan is then taken before the public in the side area, we have public uh, outreach and involvement. And we say, we think the best way to address the site is option three, whatever that is. And uh, if the public agrees, um, then we go into what's called the record of decision. And again, that goes, uh, that's a very formal step. It has to be signed off on by the EPA uh, regional administrator, sorry. And uh, this is what we looked at, why we made the decision we did, 
And this is what we're going to do. These are the cleanup levels we're going to achieve. And then this is the operation and maintenance we're going to do after the cleanup. So this is really a very formal and important step in the site process, the rod, if we will. Now, after that, we do remedial design. That's how we try to design the cleanup. We do the engineering of it. We figure out uh, how we can dispose of the stuff we're going to dig up. We do our waste profiles, et cetera get all the ducks in a row so that the actual work can occur. Contracts are written and let, and then we do the remedial action. That is, we do whatever the rod says we're going to do. <laughs> and so we implement that. Now, the remedy construction, sometimes this involves constructing a, a cap of fence. It could involve uh, constructing a groundwater treatment system and operating it for a number of years to make sure it works uh, properly and so forth. So it just depends on what the particular remedy is. Historic remedies involve constructing on-site incinerators and burning waste uh, until, you know, reach the remedial goals and landfilling ash. So really depends on what the site is and what the remedy is as to what that entails. Now, after the remedy construction, uh, you have the construction completion and post-construction completion, our little steps. See our little steps on the left, we're up to the green area now. We have pine trees in our, <laughs> in our uh, little diagram. So at that point, once the remedy has been implemented and you know everything is worked out, then we can consider deleting the site from the NPL. The cleanup is complete. Then we go into operation and maintenance phase if that's warranted, depending on site conditions. So, and then lastly, after we've cleaned up the site, we can reuse the site. Now, I, my friend over at uh, EPA who does site reuse could point out some portions of the site might be able to be deleted and reused before this end of the process. But, you know, this is a simplified diagram. So, you know, we always want to bring things back into commerce if we can. Uh, so if portions of the site are found not to be contaminated, we might cut them out of the site and delete them earlier. So just depends. All right, Tamika. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, <go>. great. <laughs> Sorry. Got stuck. <laughs> okay, well, you know, this technology is wonderful. Um, all right, so we talked about the process in general, and I thought what we should do in order to really kind of hone down on how this works is look at our newest Superfund site. Let's do a case study. Let's look at our newest Superfund site in Louisiana. This is the American Creosote and Deritter Superfund site. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through an actual example. Uh, we're not done with this one, but we're in it. Um, of course, as the name American Creosote might uh, suggest, uh, it is a wood preserving facility uh, and it is in Deritter. Um, so it operated using Creosote as wood preserving, um, you know, compound from the 1920s to the mid 1950s when it went out of business. And the picture on the right shows the, the way we used to access the site. The best way again was the railroad track that ran through the thick woods that had grown up on the site since it went out of business and uh, you know, in the 50s. It was nothing but a big patch of, of thick you know, pine and uh, yawpon and other things. I'm a biologist, so you know, I, trees get to me. All right, so the site itself was 55 acres in size, and it was owned by a company called the Central Manufacturing Company that had bought it with the idea that they could possibly redevelop it, but they quickly learned that their, the financial cost of doing that uh, was exceeded their ability. They were not financially uh, able to take on the cleanup of the site of this magnitude. So, okay. All right, so let's apply our little diagram to the American Creosote site. So we began to do the preliminary assessment at the site in 2015. Uh, EPA and uh, their contractors and DEQ all went out there and began to look at the pathways and the targets and so forth and did our you know, paperwork. And you know, it looked like, hey, this is a potentially good candidate. Um, 2016 was the site inspection, uh, EPA, uh, got access agreements and began to take samples uh, to determine uh, the extent of the contamination in regard to the pathways. Did it have NPL potential? Well, sure enough, it did. It was uh, proposed to the national priorities list in 2017 
And in 2018, it was finalized. So, you know, that's that two step. You have to publish it in the Federal Register and, you know, um, have a period when there could be comments, et cetera. And then we have to go back to the Federal Register to finalize it. So it was finalized. Uh, and in 2018, in fact, September 2018, we initiated the remedial investigation and we are uh, still there. Um, we're still working on that uh, remedial investigation. So, Tamika? All right. So, the uh, site characteristics, uh, char excuse me, characteristics of the American Creosote and Derivative Superfund site. The remaining sources are a concrete structure, which was the former pressure cylinder, or retort. That's a word you don't see too much anymore but those pressure cylinders that they used to pressure treat wood are called retorts. And that was the uh, retort house basin. Um, there was an oil water separator that had uh, creosote waste. There was an unlined wastewater pit that was heavily contaminated with creosote and waste. There are uh, various areas of soil contamination and there were piles of creosote waste uh, in the woods that uh, apparently had been uh, disposed of there when the plant was dismantled. Uh, and salvaged, I guess they salvaged what they could, and the waste was all left on site. So, next slide, please. Okay, this kind of is a, uh, a multi-step overview here. Uh, if we look on the left, uh, we see a big map that has a little white square in it. The red outline shows the 55-acre property. Um, and then the blue lines show the surface water drainage pathways from that property. And then when we look at that little white square, that gets expanded to be up on the upper left. That shows a, a zoomed in version with the process area and its contaminants. Uh, the concrete structure, the contaminated soil areas, the wastewater pit, the drainage path that had creosote all the way down, creosote pile, et cetera. So if we look on the right, uh, what we're going to see there is a historic map of the facility that shows what used to be there. It used to have a number of various little railroad tracks that were used, uh, narrow gauge railroad to move uh, logs around so that they could be treated in wooden, um, you know, structures like ties. Creosote was used in railroad ties uh, for a long time. That was a very big use of creosote material, still is. Um, and then that little red square there shows the area that's in the white square on the left. So that shows the process area, if you will. So, you know, of course, you're concerned about the process area because that's where the creosote was at. You're also concerned about some of those out, outer areas because they could be what we call drip areas when creosote was pressure treated into that wood and then it was pulled out of that retort or pressure vessel. A lot of times they'd roll it out somewhere so all the excess creosote could drip off and then that would result in soil contamination. So, all right, Tamika. All right, here's just a couple of pictures of the conditions we found at the site. And this shows uh, 2014. So this was during the, the pre-PA phase um, and site discovery phase, I guess. But uh, at the left, we see one of those concrete structures that uh, could be an oil water separator. I think that was assumed. And you see the black stuff in it, that's creosote. Creosote is listed hazardous waste, by the way. Uh, it's an FO hazardous waste. Now on the right, we see um, that open uh, surface water body that was sort of, we thought a water treatment uh, pond or something like that. Um, and that uh, has some duckweed growing on it, but it's heavily contaminated creosote all across its bottom. And of course, creosote, uh, in a, addition to having hydrocarbons and nastiness is loaded with uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, which are powerful carcinogens. So uh, that's one of the primary concerns. So uh, you notice that, that these pictures were taken in December, they're 12, 8, 2014. That's because this thing was so grown up with woods and um, you know, vegetation from the 50s that you know, that was the best time to really get in there that you know, still you had to chop away through the brush. When we were doing the PA and SI, they actually rented a bulldozer so we could bulldoze a path to the areas where we had to take samples and you know, do do some uh, drilling work. So yeah, it was, it was thick. Okay. All right. So having done the PASI on the MPL, then we had the remedial investigation. We were looking at uh, a phased investigation because EPA's budget, uh, you know, isn't what it used to be. You know, we don't have that super fund uh, tax anymore. So they're on budget and, you know, the federal budget, you know, there's all these 
uh, sequester uh, cuts and everything else from time to time. And, you know, so uh, EPA has been doing RIs as a phased investigation. Uh, so you do a portion of it, then you do some more when you have some more money and more time. And this isn't necessarily a terrible thing. I mean, instead of going out all in one year and spending, you know, millions of dollars to do all the sampling, sometimes you do some sampling, you look at those results, and you say, hey, based on that, I think I need to answer some more questions. So you go and do your next phase of sampling. So although it takes longer, sometimes it gives you better results. Um, but it's really a practical reason. It's, it's you know, it's what it is. Um, so uh, in the objectives of remedial investigation are to identify any additional source areas that we did not find during the uh, PA and SI, you know, during our initial thing, because gosh, you know, this thing has just grown up so thick. We, we have no idea what might be out there really at the beginning. We just went to the areas that we knew were likely. Uh, they wanted to identify the extent of soil contamination, you know, where were those drip areas at? Uh, where, um, you know, might there be other areas we'd have to address? We wanted to identify the extent of surface water contamination. There's really two drainage paths from the site we find out during the RI. There's one to the southeast and one to the southwest. So we, during the, uh, the, the PA and the SI, we only knew about the one to the west, um, you know, during the RI, we were able to determine, yeah, there's another drainage path and yeah, it's contaminated. So that was important. Uh, identify the extent of sediment contamination in those drainage paths. How far does it go? Where, where might we have to address it? And the groundwater, you know, where is the uh, extent of that groundwater contamination? We knew that there were some in the uh, process area, but we don't know how far it extends. And does it affect anybody's wells around there? Because all those people around there drink water from wells. And another thing we wanted to do is limit access because, um, you know, we have, you know, creosote on the surface of the ground. It could be, uh, you know, hunters or trespassers or, you know, kids playing in the woods could uh, come in contact with it. So we didn't want that to happen. The only limit to access prior to the RI was the very thick vegetation I was telling you about. It's just difficult to get in there. Well, during the RI, we had to open up pathways. We bulldozed, we made roads on the site uh, to access these areas so we could do the sampling. But that also opens it up so kids or hunters or other people could get into it. So uh, one of the goals that we did was fence the site. Uh, it cost a lot of money, but uh, it was necessary to uh, prevent access. And unfortunately, uh, we got a lot of trees damaged our fence in the recent hurricane. So we got some fence repair upcoming. It's a shame because it was all so pretty and shiny and new and now it's pine trees damage it, fall all over it. But part of the thing will we'll get fixed. All right, Tamika? Okay, so back to the Superfund process, timeline, remedial investigation and feasibility study, we're planning that to run from 2018 to 2022. Now I told you it takes a while, it's in phases. We are currently in the investigation phase and then we're going to finish that up and go into a feasibility study phase. So we're right up on schedule, we're in 2020. And you know, um, we were able to continue, EPA contractors were able to continue working through um, you know, the global pandemic, which is good because they were able to uh, work in that remote area, you know, practicing social distancing and, and using safety. You know, they said that they felt safer they would in, uh, you know, some of the big cities that they normally work in. So, hey, um, the proposed plan, we expect to have that um, ready for, you know, consumption by the public and comment in 2023. We hope to get to a record of decision at that year, too. And then we can begin the remedial design and the remedial action. Um, this may move a little bit faster because one thing that happened on this particular site is there was a bankruptcy of a company that was a successor of one of the PRPs here. Uh, it was called Tronox and EPA, the two sites in Louisiana that uh, Tronox was a potentially responsible party uh, successor for, and they recovered uh, a good amount of money for each site from the bankruptcy of this company. So we have several million dollars for each site. So it will be partially funded by that bankruptcy. So now we can move faster because we have some PRP funding. We don't have to wait for budget monies to be available. Another thing that that bankruptcy made uh, possible is we are in the process of doing an EPA removal action on the site. One of those $2 million surface removals, you know, we know we have to deal with creosote on the surface of the ground. You know, there's no way to risk assess that away. It is waste, it is high concentration. So that will be removed and disposed of. That was ongoing, again, when the COVID 
uh, you know, pandemic occurred and we had to stop. The material still staged, and uh, but we did not get to dispose of it before that happened. But we will continue that as soon as some of EPA's travel um, restrictions are lifted. Uh, they're beginning to get a little bit better over there in Dallas. So we're hoping that late this year, early next year, that we'll be able to resume that removal action. Okay, Tamika. All right, so that was our newest Superfund site in Louisiana, the American Creosote Deritter site. But uh, how many sites do we have in Louisiana? Um, how, where do they go? What kind of sites are they? I thought we'd talk about this in terms of the numbers. We'll play some Trivial Pursuit with Superfund sites here. So currently in Louisiana, on the NPL, counting uh, our American Creosote Deritter, we have 13 sites that are listed on the NPL that are we are in some stage of um, cleanup on. So um, this extends from the renal investigation phase all the way through to a long-term remedial action. So uh, we have sites that are proposed to the NPL that are long-term PRP cleanup sites, but they were never listed on the NPL. So I, you know, if you remember in the syllabus for this thing, um, we said we would discuss that concept and we will in a little bit but we have three proposed to the NPL sites that are being addressed by the PRPs that are not listed. Then deleted from the NPL, these are 13 sites that we have. Uh, see, this is kind of balanced. We've got 13 going, we have 13 cleaned up. Um, but anyway, they're deleted from the NPL. They've been remediated. Uh, two of them have been cleaned up completely and have unrestricted use. And then the rest of them are in some form of operation and maintenance of the remedy. Uh, so that can vary uh, from active to passive. But let's talk about the oldest site currently on the NPL. This is our uh, famous site, Bayou Bonfuca Superfund site in Slidell, Louisiana. It was one of the first hundred. It was listed on the NPL in 9-8 uh, of 1983. It was one of those sites that the NPL was designed for, if you will. Uh, it was one of those that they said that needs to be on it. And that uh, was, it's a serious site. It was $160 million cleanup. So that, uh, that is a uh, big site. I still manage that one. Uh, we have a groundwater pump treat operation going on. The newest site listed on the NPL, like I previously told you, that is the American Creosote Deritter site. And it was listed on 118 of 2018. So that, uh, that's where we range. So, you know, I said in the syllabus that we would, um, you know, talk about are we still finding super fun sites? Well, sort of. Um, I think that most of the things that we've listed as super fun sites uh, were known about before, but either didn't qualify for the NPL for one reason or not, or maybe we didn't look at them closely enough before. Is it possible that we'll find a site out there that could be NPL caliber that we don't know about? Yeah, it's possible. You know, um, there are certain sites that didn't really get looked at much before. Our newest sites are like shipyards. Uh, those kind of went under the radar before, but now we're looking at some of those historic shipyards that are closed. Our second newest site listed on the MPL is a shipyard, SBA shipyard. So there may be more that we don't know about. All right, so let's look at the ones listed on the MPL, the 13 that we have currently listed. The largest class of sites in Louisiana that are currently listed are wood treating sites. Wood treating sites are always nasty and always a long-term cleanup. Um, we have seven currently listed on MPL. So that's uh, where we're at. Uh, lots of them, and we talked about a couple. Um, next most frequently listed on the MPL currently is the waste processing and disposal sites. There are three of those listed right now uh, that we're actively working on. Agriculture Street Landfill, certain operable units are still listed. Certain operable units have been deleted. But um, we have Combustion Inc., which is over in Livingston Parish. That one's currently in a phytoremediation uh, process. And then we have Petro Processors, which is north of Baton Rouge. And that is in a enhanced natural attenuation, a bioremediation process. So that's uh, in remission, I like to say. We have two shipyards. Shipyards are a growth area for EPA Superfund program. We've uh, got Delta Shipyard and SPA Shipyard. These are both recently listed. They're the two that were listed most recently, um, except for the uh, American Creosote Deritter. We have federal facility. We have one federal facility. Um, 
this is a site that the federal government is actually responsible for. And when we say federal facilities, it could be anything from uh, NASA facility uh, to, but you know, 90% of them I'd say, uh, it could be a Department of Energy facility, but 90% uh, of them are probably military facilities nationwide. Uh, nobody can mess up a site like the military is what we say. I mean, uh, you know, historically before there were laws, you know, the military used a lot of chemicals. They used a lot of explosives and other stuff. And, uh, you know, there were no laws against disposing of them on site. And often that's exactly what happened. So uh, a lot of these have uh, problems. The Louisiana Army Ammunition Plant has a number of AOIs that are um, under, you know, federal uh, monitoring. Uh, now, we call this in uh, Louisiana now Camp Minden. It's uh, operated by the Louisiana National Guard but uh, the Army is still responsible from this. This was a big uh, weapons plant for World War II, and it's located up there um, around Doylene. Um, it's uh, near Bossier. Uh, there was another one in Texas called uh, Longhorn Army Ammunition Plant that was a sister facility, and these facilities made all the big bombs that were used in World War II, uh, you know, during the air war in Europe and, and Japan as well. So uh, they were explosives plants, so, all right. Tamika. Now, let's look at what I told you I'd tell you about the proposed to the NPL and why they don't get listed. So we have the um, one site up in Bossier that is proposed and it's never been listed and it's called the Highway 7172 Refinery Site. Um, that's what EPA calls it. That's what's listed on the NPL and on the websites as. We call it Old Sitgo. It's another name for it. It's in Bossier City. Well, it's really in Bossier City. It's under a lot of the downtown area there. Uh, so that, um, that is uh, the explanation of why it and the other sites are not finalized. And this is from a document that I cut and pasted. It says EPA did not finalize the site on the NPL. The site's PRP addressed the cleanup by employing an alternative approach that requires the same investigation, cleanup process, and standards that were required for sites listed on the NPL. So as EPA proposes these sites to the NPL, and then the PRPs enter into some type of cooperative agreement, or in EPA they call it administrative orders on consent, uh, in order to clean up the site. Um, so there is no need in EPA's uh, view at that point to go ahead and list it on the NPL. As long as the PRP enters into some kind of uh, legally binding cleanup um, plan with EPA and everything continues to go well, then there's no need to list it. Now, had they failed to abide by the plan or whatever, then it could be listed on the NPL. So all you have, it's proposed, all you have to do is, you know, step that up. It's kind of like drawing back your fist and saying, don't make me hit you. Anyway, all right, so. Uh, then the other two sites that we have, um, and these are the Devil Swamp Lake Superfund site, North Baton Rouge, which is where PCBs were discharged in Devil Swamp Lake by Rollins historically. And then we have Intergy, North Ryan Street. That's a former coal gasification facility, an oil gasification facility on North Ryan Street. Also, there was a lot of PCB disposal there. Intergy, it was run by GSU before Intergy, and uh, Intergy became the the PRP when they absorb GSU. So um, that is being addressed by Entergy and it's in operation maintenance at this point. Um, so it's proposed to the NPL, but uh, never was necessary to list it. And of course, uh, we had the Highway 71, 72, it was a refinery site and uh, we discussed that. So that's our three, our three proposed to the NPL. Now we're thinking about deproposing the 7071 site because we're almost reaching all the remedial goals. So. All right, so Louisiana Superfund sites by types. Now these are the deleted from the NPL. There are two that are finished and all the rest are an O&M. The largest class of site was the waste processing and disposal sites. There were seven of those, which is, um, you know, there's a number of those that are scattered about. And uh, then we have two metal sites. Uh, we have Delat Metals on Ponchatoula and Ruston Foundry, which is not in Ruston, it's in Alexandria. I know the name is confusing. But uh, the Ruston Foundry is one of our two sites that was cleaned up to unlimited use levels. And so that's a great success story there. Uh, refineries, we had the Mallard Bay Landing Bulk Plant. That's another great success. We cleaned that up to unlimited use levels. 
it's safe for residential development if they want to. I don't think they will because it's at a landing on the intercoastal waterway, but you could if you want to. Then we have the uh, old Inger refinery, which was a state cleanup, uh, and we are still in O&M on that one. We have to maintain fencing, all that. Wood treating, we have central wood preserving. Uh, that is finished. It's uh, in O&M, and uh, the parish actually is conducting the O&M there. There's a capped area and a fence, and they maintain that. Uh, shipyard, one, Southern Shipbuilding. This has uh, been redeveloped, and it's uh, in private ownership now, um, Port of Slidell. Uh, corporation runs that now and they maintain and operate the site so so those are deleted so they're in O&M all right Tamika all right so let's talk about that concept of O&M or operation maintenance you know these super fun sites they're the worst of the worst they have big problems some of them have big cleanups. sometimes it's not technically possible to completely clean up the site and you know, we like to do that where we can Sometimes it's not technically possible and sometimes it's not financially possible. Um, you know, Bayou Bonfuca cost $160 million to clean up the surface. It was incineration of a mile of Bayou sediment and uh, they built an on-site incinerator, um, hazardous waste incinerator on-site and operated it for a number of years. And we cleaned up the surface soil, we cleaned up the Bayou sediment, restored Bayou Bonfuca uh, to its, you know, ecological conditions we've even lifted the fish advisory now it's safe to fish there so a lot of work was done but subsurface oil and groundwater that would have cost gosh knows how much more we have been pumping and treating that groundwater ever since the cleanup was completed in the 90s and we will be from now on as far as I'm concerned I don't know if we'll ever get there but uh, that's uh, that's where we're at Following the remedy construction, uh, the site may or may not be deleted from the MPL. Now, that's an interesting concept. Sometimes they're not. Um, you know, sometimes they go into LTRA, or long-term remedial action. Our American Creosote Winfield site is in, in uh, long-term remedial action. We disagreed with EPA on the cleanup. We wanted a more complete cleanup, and uh, they uh, didn't want to spend all that much more money on it. So with the agreement I think that was entered into is that they would keep it in LT LTRA rather than us taking it over as O&M. Uh, we have a million dollar pump and treat a year on that particular site. That's the O&M. We in the state pay 10%. Um, so that's a good point. I haven't made that uh, point before this, but uh, before we get to O&M, when we do the remedy, uh, EPA does all the what's called pipeline costs. They do the PA, they do the SI, they do the, the um, RI, they do the FS, and it's only when we get to that record of decision that the state has to start paying for the orphan sites. Now, if there's PRPs, you know, great. You know, the PRPs pay, the taxpayers uh, of the state of Louisiana and of the federal government, uh, we have some overlap there. We, we are not, uh, you know, tapped for that. So that's great if there's PRPs. Uh, but if there's not, then EPA pays 90% of the cleanup costs from the remedial action to O&M. So the remedy itself, EPA pays 90% on the orphan sites and the state has to match 10%. So, you know, on that Bayou Bonfuca $160 million incineration, the state had to come up with $16 million, which, you know, if you look at 10% is a pretty good deal, you know, but it's still $16 million. Go to the legislature and ask for $16 million. That's a hard sell. But uh, anyway, so, but the this changes when a site goes into operation and maintenance, okay? Someone else has to pay for it because the EPA cannot conduct O&M according to CERCLA. The PRPs, the state governments or local governments must assume O&M duties. So if there is a long-term remedial action, that's a different thing, but whenever we delist a site, we take it off the NPL, uh, then it goes into O&M and somebody else has to maintain that site. So uh, if we do delete it, then, and there's O&M, then we have to go in that. Now, uh, if site's been completely remediated, you know, great, awesome. If we've completely cleaned up everything, it's unlimited use, then there's no O&M. But if it has not been completely remediated or we have some type of engineering controls like a cap or a groundwater treatment system or whatever it may be that uh, O&M is required. And so, and I've mentioned that we have 
some PRPs. We have private landowners. We have the state government, which, you know, we have three, three or more sites that we're doing O&M. It just varies. Um, three active O&M and some other passive O&M. And then in some cases, it's local governments. Like I say, you know, East Feliciana Parish take care of Central Wood Preserving. So um, now O&M can be anything from active groundwater pump tree. It could be other kinds of remediation systems. Um, it could be cap maintenance, maintaining that clay cap put over contaminated soil. It could be groundwater monitoring. Maybe we're just monitoring the groundwater every so often. Uh, maybe we have to maintain some kind of fencing. Maybe we have to do vegetation control. We have to uh, mow that cap a couple times a year to make sure that it does not grow trees that will compromise its integrity. So, all right, Tamika. Great. Now, here is the Bayou Bonfuca groundwater treatment system. Um, this is, uh, Oh, this is a big thorn in my side. Um, this one is an active pump treat at that Bayou Bonfuca Superfund site. At the time I made up these slides, it was costing us approximately $30,000 a month for contractors to operate this for us because that includes two full-time employees that are maintaining the facility, operating the groundwater treatment. There's three well arrays, one's in a neighborhood across the Bayou pumping creosote out of people's yards. Uh, there's two of them that are on site that's controlling the plume, keeping it from moving and trying to bring it back in and get it cleaned up. And uh, then the creosote is in this facility you see in front of you, the creosote is filtered out through um, a combination of oil water separators, uh, sand filters, and finally by uh, the resulting water is polished through carbon filtration and then is discharged uh, back to the bayou under a, a water discharge permit uh, like limitation. So it's uh, cleaned up to the water, groundwater is cleaned up to a point where we can discharge it back to the bayou. And uh, it's, it's quite the thing. It was uh, state of the art in the 1990s when it was built. And I think it was 2002, they handed the state of Louisiana the keys and said, okay, it's O&M now, and now you're responsible. And so we will be responsible for this particular site until we reach the cleanup standards, which are the maximum contaminant levels for groundwater. EPA cleans up groundwater till it's drinkable. So uh, that's, that's the cleanup standard we have to apply to this site. And I don't know that we'll ever reach it, uh, but we're, we're bound to do so. Uh, we may consider trying to change the rod or something to look at some other options down the road. But at this point, that's what uh, we pay. So, all right, next slide. Here's another active pump and treat that the state of Louisiana has a uh, obligation to, uh, well, I don't know if it's really pump and treat, it's more of a passive DNAPL recovery system. There's sort of a herringbone French drain system under the Madisonville Creosote uh, Superfund site. Um, this was another site where thermal desorption was used to clean up surface, but the subsurface has some uh, lenses, have creosote and uh, contaminated groundwater. So the groundwater is collected in a DNAPL recovery array, and then it's pumped into this nice metal building that you see in front of you. And then um, it is treated and then discharged into this ditch by the road that you see. Uh, everything looks dead out there because this was taken in January. And uh, I don't know if you notice that on the right upper corner of the picture, is a giant live oak tree. It's a historic tree that's actually on the register of historic live oak. So that's kind of a, everybody likes to, you know, enjoy that while they're there. It's quite the, the large and old tree. So this particular site, uh, you see in front of you, the sign by the mailbox, it says DEQ bidders. We bid this uh, contract to operate the site out every three years uh, to try to get the best value for the, uh, the uh, you know, DQ and uh, consequently uh, the taxpayers. And so at this point, uh, it, it was 15K a month when uh, this slide was made. We've had a second, a, another bid since then. And I'm glad to say it went down several thousand dollars a month. So we're getting a better deal now. We had more competition on the bidding. So that's great. All right, to me. Now, this is the old Inger refinery. Um, this particular site uh, is another type of OM. This one had um, a capped area and it, vegetation needed to be controlled on that capped area. You can see that it's been mowed in the foreground um, and the, then it was supposed to be fenced to prevent access. And that's all part of the O&M that's supposed to be done. The unfortunate thing is uh, that, you know, during our various budget issues that we had uh, some years ago, 
uh, the, the, you know, the fencing was neglected. And during that time of neglect, we had uh, hurricanes like Katrina and Gustav that uh, knocked over some of those big trees you see outside of the site. Uh, this is over uh, near the Batcher on the Mississippi River, so you get some really big trees. And some of those trees, you can see some of the wood in the picture, they fell on the fence and, and damaged it and took it down. So that was the fencing condition, as you can see it there is poor. And so we paid in 2018, 2019, about $76,000 to repair fencing. So uh, we kind of got a bad review from EPA on a five-year review on the site because we were not keeping up our end of the O&M. And so we're trying to uh, fix that up. I think at this point, um, uh, I, we just had an inspection and Delta did not knock down any more fence. So we're good and we, we have repaired it all. It is in all good shape now. Now we just have to keep it that way. So we're gonna try to keep it up. All right. All right, so now let's talk about that last step, you know, those green hills and EPA's diagram. Site reuse, we wanna bring the sites back into commerce where we can. It is really a major goal of the Superfund program to remediate sites so that they can be brought back into use or in commerce, they can be used again. Um, so this is uh, one of the things EPA strives to do wherever possible. Um, sometimes it's possible for a portion of the site to be reused um, and while the other portion of the site is not reused because it's still undergoing some remediation. We had that at the Bayou Bonfuca Superfund site. A uh, portion of the site was cleaned up to the extent where it could be used as Slidell's Heritage Park and we'll look at some pictures of that in a little bit. Um, other um, examples we'll look at uh, include uh, downtown Bowdoin. Um, now, historically under the Superfund program, back in the 80s to the 90s, they didn't really always consider that reuse potential. They didn't uh, look at that, bringing it back into commerce. You know, I think the Brownfield Initiative and um, the uh, Voluntary Remediation Program, we started trying to clean up things so that people could reuse them again. Instead of developing new land to be another industrial site, let's use the industrial sites we already have. So, um, there were some cleanups that involved cap fencing and monitors. Uh, you know, we'd put a, a big cap on it. Sometimes we'd build a landfill on the site to address the waste. Uh, we'd put a fence around it and put some monitoring wells. And we'd say, look, we cleaned it up. We remediated it. And we did. But a lot of times, you know, we stopped the exposure. You know, we reduced the risk. But did we make it possible for that site to be reused? Well, not always, you know, we got a number of those that, uh, you know, that's what we still have. We've got a landfill that's capped and got to be mowed a couple times a year, got to be monitored, and uh, nobody really wants to use it for anything. So not true good. Those took the property out of commerce. Sometimes that was the only feasible way to do it. Sometimes that was the most cost effective way to do it, but it didn't help us with the reuse. Um, now, I will say though that capped landfills are sometimes being reevaluated for other uses, whether that's grazing potential for animals, you know, uh, get you some sheep or uh, cows or something, um, or as solar farms, uh, you know, putting solar panels on big uh, frames that stand up above the ground. So if landfill settles or moves, you know, it doesn't matter. And underneath it, you can still graze your sheep. Uh, another big thing on these landfills and cap sites is what we call pollinator meadows. You plant them with uh, perennial plants that are good for a wildlife and uh, you know insects that pollinate our crops as well as you know native plants and you try to grow these things up to you have basically sort of a native prairie um, growing on the landfill and this is great because uh, I just recently uh, sat in on a thing on that you reduce your um, your maintenance cost if you only have to say mow it once a year you're good so all right Tamika's rushing me to the next slide. Come on, Tamika. Let's go. <laughs> That's good. Okay, Bayou Bonfuca Superfund site. Um, this is, like I say, been redeveloped into Heritage Park. On the left, you see a bunch of EPA officials and city officials at a, you know, a Superfund um, revitalization. They gave them a nice, uh, you know, trophy and plaque. It's a clear one. You can't see it, but the mayor of, uh, mayor at the time, slide I was holding it. But they redeveloped the, the, portion of the Bayou Bonfuca site to be a park that's one of the most heavily used areas in downtown Slidell. People are always walking there. They have concerts. They, they have picnics. And they also have this great marina that was recently developed. Uh, the city got some grant money 
and they built this wonderful marina facility so that people can bring their boats in from Lake Pontchartrain, park at the park, enjoy the park, go to fireworks displays that they have there, or concerts, and walk into Old Town Slidell and, you know, go to restaurants and go to, uh, to craft shops and so forth and enjoy the, uh, the facilities and uh, businesses, okay? Next, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Highway 70, 172 refinery site, which is uh, what that proposed NPL site. And uh, I don't know if it's so much redevelopment, it was development, because when we found the site, it was pretty much already developed. What we'll point out on the left is the Alexis Park Apartments sign, which um, the Alexis Park Apartments is where the site came to light in the early 1990s. I was uh, familiar with this when it occurred. The, um, the Lexus Park apartments were built on an area of the site had contaminated groundwater, had hydrocarbons floating on the groundwater. And uh, what happened is the apartment building began to act as a vapor trap for that subsurface uh, vapor intrusion pathway. And that vapor trap built up um, you know, methane in the walls of the apartments to the point where a fire marshal um, or, you know, went in there and put a uh, combustible gas indicator into the wall of one of the apartments in the downstairs area. And uh, they got above the lower LEL. That meant, uh, you know, had he been smoking at the time, that he could have blown the whole place to smithereens. Uh, so that was how we discovered the site. And uh, then it became NPL. And it's been, like I say, we're almost done with this site. We're very close. And some of the things there, of course, the Alexis Park Apartments, they've been able to, they moved everybody out of them for a while. And the lower floors were then uninhabitable. Then uh, after the, th the cleanup progressed and the situation improved, then people could move back into them and they're fully, um, you know, fully uh, occupied at this time. So uh, I guess they've been developed and redeveloped. But anyway, other things over there, they got the Hilton Garden Inn, Homewood Suites. That's near the junction right there, that big sign showing just some of the things that uh, are there, as well as the other businesses up Highway 71, 72, all over the side area. So, okay, Tamika. Okay, so this is me. Um, I've got my um, mailing address and stuff there uh, in case you think of something later or if you have anything uh, you know, that you want to contact me about. And I've also put on the slide a link to our current listing of Superfund sites. This is maintained on the DEQ website under our remediation uh, division. And so we, uh, that's the current one, uh, but we'll put the new one there too. So that's the, uh, the list if you want to look at that you can follow that link. So, um, okay. Now I think uh, we're going to go to questions at this point, if I'm right. So I think Tamika yes. will take over. Yes. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for participating, everyone. 